Well, hello everybody. Welcome back. It's been a while since we've done one of these recorded sessions, but here we are. We're going to be making a complete experience today. You're going to be given the full uh, week this week to create this experience, and you'll find that you've got additional challenges as well, which are included on the next slide, and you can take it even further if you want to. But here is the core of what we're going to be doing today while people are doing their presentations. Setting up multiple screens, which includes menu, game, win, and lose screen, though of course we could set up more if we wanted to. Using Text Mesh Pro to be using interesting and high quality text. Uh, for VR, Text Mesh Pro is the mandatory type of text we're going to be using, whether that's for buttons or text or icons, because regular text looks awful in VR. So let's get used to using it. Writing a script to change between scenes and then making that transition happen to start off with on button click. Setting up spawn points based on randomness, so if your game depends on spawn points, this is going to be a key thing for you guys. Setting up and using timers, again many people's games are going to be using timing systems. Collecting objects to increase a score, also playing a sound when you collide with that to, to get that collection noise, giving some feedback to the player that they've achieved something. Establishing win and lose conditions for the game as well to make it a complete experience. Recording the score in the player prefs. Uh, and having that save between plays. The way that's going to work is on the main menu, the player will have zero score the first playthrough, but the next playthrough that score will increase and you'll be able to record the highest score uh, as it wears on. So we'll keep it simple for today and just have the current score replaces the previous one. If we get a chance, we'll increase that to be, if it's better than, it will replace it, otherwise it won't. And then the final one here, creating and using a build. Because we're not going to be in the room this week because we're doing presentations, the way we're going to assess this work is you're going to create a build and you're going to submit that build to your teacher for assessment at the end of the week sessions. So for many of you, that's going to be towards the Friday of the week, uh, but for 632, probably on the end of Thursday, as it's a full session for you anyway. There are some additional bonus points up for grabs as well. This list may grow a little bit, so keep an eye on the PowerPoint, which is on Moodle. Um, making the enemy chase the player, making an enemy do damage to the player when close enough, making the enemy defeat the player and go to the loose screen when the player is defeated, and then animating our collectibles, which are going to be a set of coins, to bob up and down. I will probably add to that list for people who want to take it even further. But you can get bonus, point, well, bonus points as well for adding increased complexity or adding additional features based on the skills we've taught so far. So let's start off, as is usually the way, with part one, setting up multiple scenes. First thing I'd like to do is to remember we, we are going to be starting with our template. If you can, pause the video at this point and go and create the FPS template if you haven't done already. Go do that now and I'll catch you in a second. Good, we're welcome back to the FPS template. All I've done in this scene um, is I've added a cylinder and I've used the scale tool over here to squash that cylinder down a little bit so it looks like a coin. And the only other thing I've done is I've created a new folder, created a new folder which I've called materials and in there I've created a new material which I've called yellow and I've dragged that onto here to represent a coin. What I'm also going to do with this coin is I'm going to go to the capsule collider which is the colliding surface attached to this um, this object and I'm going to turn it to, into a trigger. So I'm going to, to turn is trigger to be true. Well, that'll come in important later, and I'll remind you of that later if you didn't quite do that at this point. But I just want this coin to be a trigger. That's all I've done that's different. To prove that this is still just working, it should just be the regular game as we would normally expect. It's exactly what we're used to within our template. Because this coin is a trigger, I can walk through it. If you're not walking through yours, uh, you haven't cho uh, chosen the is trigger option. So make sure you do that now. This coin is going to be our collectible, and the idea is score will increase as time wears on. So the first thing we need to do is to set up multiple scenes. We've got our game scene already set up. We need a menu, a win, and a lose. And we need to make it look pretty by using Text Mesh Pro. So let's go do that. First thing to note is we've got a scenes folder, which is here by default. And in the scenes folder, you've got the playground scene. And if you look in the top left-hand corner, you can see I named this project Complete Game. And the currently open scene is playground, which is what you can see here. So if ever you don't know what scene you're on, just have a look up there. And if you make any major changes to your scene, it will give you an indication that it hasn't yet been saved. So I 
control S regularly. We're going to create a new scene to be our main menu. So I'm going to right click anywhere in the scene space, create a new scene, which I can never find. There it is next to create. And I'm going to call this main. Notice how I've used uppercase for this. And I'm going to create a new scene, which is going to be win and one for lose. Let's start with our main menu. I'm going to double click on it. If you haven't recently saved your scene, it will ask you want to save the scene before you move around. It looks like all your work has gone uh, and vanished. It hasn't. It's just we're in a new scene now. Your playground is still there. Your main scene isn't there. One thing that's interesting about the way camera transitions work between scenes is in the editor, if I point this way and go into my main scene, my virtual camera is still pointing that direction at that point in space. What's happened is it's just unloaded all of the data from the other scene. So if I go back to Playground, I'm still pointing that same direction I was a moment ago. Same as if I go over here, I'm now pointing a different direction. So do note that the uh, jumping between scenes, it can sometimes be a bit confusing because if you're really far away, as we're going to be in our main menu, and you go back to your Playground scene, you may have to zoom in each time. Currently, we've got our main camera and directional light. And what we need to do is to create our user interface. Game object UI for user interface, and we're going to be using some of the features on here. We're going to start with some text using Text Mesh Pro, and it will ask, Do we want to import it? And yes, we do. Text Mesh Pro is a very powerful tool, comes with a bit of complexity and some extra details, but here we are. That's created for us a canvas because we didn't have a canvas previously, and an event system both of which are critical. If you don't have an event system, it won't respond to button clicks, particularly in VR. There's a slightly different version of this for VR, but it works in the same way, and it needs to de detect those events that pick up. If I double click on the canvas, it will zoom out to be the view of the canvas. And if I click on 2D mode, which is over here next to the light bulb, we get a view of our canvas. The reason why you've got this kind of uh, shape at the moment is the canvas is trying to fit the shape of your game window. So you notice here the game window is quite rectangular, but if I were to squash it by doing that and I go back to my scene, you'll find that it's also now trying to match that shape, which is quite clever, but not what we want. We always want 16 by 9 aspect ratio, which is what most monitors are 16 by 9. So if you go into the game window, instead of free aspect, we can either choose 16 by 9 or we can force it into full HD 1920 by 1080, which is what I recommend. That will force it into um, widescreen. And then if I go back to scene, no matter what I do to the game window, it will always be the right size and shape. You'll notice as well the text, which was our text that was there, is now visible, it's in the middle of the screen. And we've got tools, which is this one here, which is the Rect tool. Notice how we've got the Rect transform rather than the usual transform tools. It's because it's in a rectangle. It's a text box. Because we're in 2D mode, we're never going to move on the Z axis, which is the depth. We're going to move on the X and the Y, but we really shouldn't move on the Z. It should remain the same depth. So you can change the size of this, but be aware with text. There are two different options. You always want to increase the size using the, um, the little blue blobs around the corners, not the squares in the center, because that is your margin. That changes uh, how far away or the padding is from the edge of the text box, but we never want to fiddle with that. We just want to move the text box around, which you can do by changing that. If you balls it up, you can line it back up, but I find it's just way easier to control Z if you realize you make a mistake there. So this is going to be the title, and because we're in 2D mode, it will snap uh, to key points like when it's center aligned. I'm going to take our new text. I'm going to write in the text mesh pro box over here, the name of our game. Let's come up with something interesting. I'm sure that's totally legal. Uh, let's increase the font size as well. Notice that by increasing the font size, it will wrap around if it gets too big for the text box. So you can increase the size of the text box if you want, remembering to center align it. And you can center align the text inside of the text box through the alignment tools, which are here. You can change the vertex color to be something more interesting. Yeah, 
that's offensively green let's go with that and you've got some other setting as well first thing i want to show you though is your game is not going to be using the default font that font looks ugly and that is this liberation font which is here so if you go to font asset and you click on it you'll be surprised by how few fonts you have access to you've got just these two fonts here and you're like well not really changing anything the way you create a font in text mesh pro is you have to feed it existing fonts from your font folder or download new fonts off the internet they're easy to find uh, in the case of windows you can just go to your c drive and you can search for font there you go, there's your fonts folder on the c drive um, actually selecting the one on the c drive this drive, C, font, there you go. there's your font folder, or should be, Windows, that's what I was looking for, in C Windows, you go in there, you've got your font folder, which contains all of your fonts, you can of course just go on the internet, go to some font websites, and you can, you can choose some new fonts, you don't have to stick with the ones that are built in, but here's what we're going to do, inside of, oh, I think it's Window, and Text Mesh Pro, You've got the font asset creator. That's where you drag in your font of choice. Let's go with a military looking one. Hmm. I want you guys to go on the internet and find a really good one. I'm going to settle with you. You'll do. There we go. Yeah, you'll do. I'm sure you guys can come up with better. I'm going to drag and drop that in there. Notice how it won't go straight in. It needs to go into your assets first. So just drag that onto the asset space and then you'll see the font is sitting there ready to be used. So you can drag and drop that into there. Generate a font atlas. Save that font atlas in your asset space. So just hit save and now you'll see there is a new text mesh pro font which we can now choose from the list. Oh that looks awful. Let's go with it. So some of the settings that we've got here, if you want to, you've got some of the settings about adding things like um, uh, the outline, things like underlay and glow and other things. I'd advise being careful with these because these affect the shader. So this will affect all text in your game in the same way. So if you apply a glow here, and if we click to expand your glow, and we add a nice offset to it, and that looks pretty cool. We add an inner, oh, no, maybe not, an outer, increase the power. You know, that looks interesting. But now every type of text we create, if I right click on canvas and go to UI and create a new text with Text Mesh Pro, I expect it to have the same behaviors. But it doesn't. Okay. Text Mesh Pro has changed. Knock yourself out, guys. Have some fun with the glow features. But don't delete your text. That's daft. There we go. So have some fun with that. Make it look cool. The other thing that you'll notice is when you press play, you've still got your skybox in the background, which is not usually what you would want in your game. So to change that, to make sure you've not got your skybox in the background, right click on your canvas, create a new element of UI, and we just want a panel. This panel will fill the UI element. Remember that box will completely fill your screen. So as long as it's filling the box, it will fill what you see. Your text has now been grayed out because your text and your panel are on the same layer. If you want your text to appear on top of your panel, drag it and make it a child of the panel and now it will pop on top. I'm gonna to select the panel and I don't want its color to be uh, that gray anymore. I don't want it to be semi-transparent. I want it to have an alpha of 100%, so 255, and choose a color that you feel is appropriate. You can also choose an image of your choice. So there's a bunch that are already in here. That's awful. That's awful. You get these are designed to be icons, but I'm going to choose none. If you did get an image from the internet and you wanted it to be a sprite, you just have to choose that image when it gets imported in here. On the right hand side you've got the, the option to choose something like sprite and UI. Then you've got to click apply before it will be uh, acceptable there to see in your source image. Other thing we're going to do is right click on our panel and we're going to create a new UI element which is going to be a button that uses Text Mesh Pro. Button that uses Text Mesh Pro. 
and you can increase the size of your button. Notice that your button, uh, you can't edit the text, there's no option to change the text on your button. You'll be able to change that on the text, which is a child of the button. There you go, play game, and you can do all of those things you wanted to for. Let's choose the same style of font, because consistency in this game is good. And I think, has that applied the glow? No, I really am making stuff up today. Um, let's apply a nice outline to it. Let's apply green, where's green? Have some fun, is what I'm saying here. Um, Okay, you can definitely see there that that option is affecting everything. That's the behaviour I was expecting to see. Have some fun with it. So there we go. We've got a pedestrian title. We've got the name of the game. And the only other thing I would like you to add is your name somewhere. So I'm going to right-click on the panel. UI text that uses Text Mesh Pro. And I'm going to snap this down the bottom corner somewhere. Use the same font for consistency sake. Yeah, definitely pick up the green glow now. Okay, don't quite know what we're doing different, but there you go. Uh, that way I can just see who's developed it, and that's the thing you'll be asked in the expo as well, making sure you've got your name on your main menu. There's a lot more I could show you about how you can organise text and stuff, but the only other thing we really need to add here is I'm going to add a new piece of UI text with Text Mesh Pro, and I'm going to put that here, and I'm going to write high score. We're not going to do anything with high score quite yet, but I'm going to snap that there and I'm going to make another one next to it. Why not? UI text with text mesh pro, put that beside it. You see it tries to line up and I'm just going to put a zero in there for now. So the current high score is zero. Notice that that is a piece of text and that is a piece of text. We can do whatever we like with that later on. Control S, main menu, largely finished. We now need to make our buttons work and we can jazz up our other effects as time wears on as well. So let's add some script to this. In order to make this work, we're gonna go into our scripts folder. Currently, we've got some scripts already in there provided. We don't want to change those. I'm gonna right click and create a new script. And this would be a C sharp script. Notice that if you press enter at this point and then change the name of the script, that will break it. So if you have pressed enter, uh, delete script, right click and uh, recreate it. And we're going to give it a name, something like change scenes. And this is going to hold all of the scripts for changing scenes. So C sharp script, change scenes, all one word and press enter. Reason why it does that is you'll notice over here it's created the class and it's called that change scenes. If you press enter before you do it, it creates the class with the incorrect name, the one with new mono behavior or whatever it is. Remember, if you don't get auto complete, you need to go to edit and project settings and make sure that we're talking to Visual Studio. I've done it again edit and preferences and make sure the external tools are talking to Visual Studio. External tools, make sure it's talking to Visual Studio. If you have had to change that, reclose, close Visual Studio and reopen it. Otherwise the autocomplete will not work for you and you will have a bad day. Because we're going to be changing scenes, we need to be using Unity Engine dot scene management. So we're going to be using Unity Engine. So underneath there, I've copy pasted that dot scene management. Notice there are two lines there, Unity Engine and Unity Engine dot scene management. I no longer want the update and start functions. Clear them off. What we're interested in is creating our own custom functions for changing between scenes. So this is going to be public so everything can see it. It's going to be void because it won't return anything to the script that, that tries to use it. That's what void refers to there. And then we need to give it a name. So let's call it something like load um, game. That will do. Open close regular brackets, open close squiggly brackets. And the job of load game is going to be tell the scene manager to load the thing called whatever your game is called. Void scene manager dot load scene. 
and then the name of the scene you want to load, which you've probably forgotten because I've forgotten. Uh, it is called Playground. There we go. In order to make sure you get your spelling exactly right here, here's some suggestions. Right click, rename, control C to copy it, click off so we don't actually rename it, and then paste it in there. That way you know you will always get it right. So what we're going to do is every time something tries to load the game, it says, Oi Scene Manager, load the playground scene. We're now going to do the same, but for all of our other things we could possibly want. Notice how I've got the squiggly bracket there and the close squiggly bracket there. I'm just going to move that down so it's a little bit more readable. This is going to load the windscreen. Open the close regular brackets, open the close squiggly brackets. And I'm going to copy paste that. And instead of loading playground, I'm going to load the scene that we called win. If you called yours something differently, it must match up. I'm going to copy paste because I'm feeling particularly lazy today. This is going to load the lose screen. And that will load the thing that we called lose, assuming I called it lose with a capital L. Never hurts to double check. Yes, it did. And potentially one for loading the main as well, because we'll probably want the lose screen to take us to the, back to the main menu, because our main menu tells us what our high score was. Control S. That's that script written. We now want, uh, actually let's just put that script back on there for a moment so people can see everything that's in it. So from the um, change scenes class all the way down to the bottom, that's what you should have. A little squiggly on line 6 and mine finishes about line 28, but you can see the pairings. If you don't have pairings, you're missing something. If you're not finishing each thing with a open close regular bracket, it's not going to work. And if you've got any of these that have the same name, that will be broken as well. They must have different names. So in order to tell the button to use that script that we just wrote and to tell it to load the game, which is that little function we wrote there, we need to say, uh, attach that script to an object in this scene. I like to attach it to the canvas because that makes sense to me. The canvas holds all of this UI. I've got the scripts folder and we wrote that script called change scene. I could drag and drop it onto the canvas like that. That would work. Or you can add a com component that's called change scenes. Notice that that's the one we created. We're not making a new script. We're, we're adding the one that we have already written. Attach it. That will attach it to the canvas, but the button still doesn't know how to use it. If I click on the button, notice not the text, the button. If I scroll down under the button component, we have the on click event. So when this button is clicked, what should it do? You can click the plus icon to add. Um, what's called the listener, what it's listening for, or the event handler. If you drag the canvas into that slot, notice that was a click and a drag, not a click followed by a drag. It was a single action, otherwise it will select the canvas and you won't be able to see your options. So button, click and drag the canvas into that slot there. And then it says, which function do you want to load? Well, if you click on that drop down, we wrote a script called change scenes, which is on that object, and we wrote a bunch of scripts in there called load game, load lose, load main, load win. Well, we want the play game button to load the game, please. There you go. The next thing you need to make sure is set up is the build settings. So if I go to file and build settings, these are all the scenes that are currently in your game. We've got more than that, but as far as the game engine is build, built, uh, concerned, that's all that's in your build. In order to get this to work, you go to the asset space, you go into your scenes, and we need to consider the build order. So I want the main menu, I want the loose screen, which currently doesn't have anything in it, I want the win screen, which doesn't have anything in it, but I don't want that build order, I don't want the game to load before the main menu, so grab the main menu, drag it, move it up to the top, and that is now the build order. You can see the IDs on the right hand side. Main will load before playground, which will load before lose, which will load before main. However, playground is going to have some code in it that will say either go to lose or main, dependent on the conditions. 
I'm going to do a control S to save that and test it because we never trust anything. There's our game. Looks. Ugh. It's a main menu. It's not a good main menu. Yours should look nicer than mine. If I press play game, what happens? You're trying to read input using the input class, but you switch to input handling. Okay, so that's again a feature of using the new input system. Do you remember we had this problem with using this template before? Edit, project settings, player, scroll down to where we get to... Uh, it's this bit here, what's that called? The other settings. So the other settings may be minimized, maximize them. Scroll down here, active input handling, we're going to use both. This was the exact same issue we had a while ago. It'll force Unity to restart. So just make sure that's set as well, otherwise it won't be detecting the left mouse click. You can probably skip this part of the video, to be honest. I'm not going to say anything particularly interesting. Still not saying anything particularly interesting. No, you can you can totally skip this part of this video. You feel free. Feel free. You move. You can stay if you want, or you can, you can zoom forward a little bit. It's fine. You're not going to miss anything hugely interesting, honestly. Everyone had a good weekend? There we go. Right, so there we go. Now that should work. There's no reason why it shouldn't. We're pressing play game, and that loads the game. Exciting stuff, right? So we have now set up multiple scenes. We are using Text Mesh Pro. And now we've written a script to change between scenes and we've made that happen for the first part. We're obviously going to have different conditions, so the making it happen, half done. Setting up spawn points based on randomness. We're going to do that and then we'll split the video in half probably at that point. So notice that the button doesn't work while the game isn't running. So I'm going to go back to scenes and I'm going to go back to our playground scene. Notice we're still in 2D mode and it all looks really confusing. Go out of 2D mode and we're really far away. I will just double click on the player capsule in the hierarchy to zoom in so we can see what we're doing. We've got a coin. And if you remember, I asked you to tell that coin, tell its capsule collider to be a trigger so the player should be able to move through them. We're going to write a script on the player that will say when we collide with anything that is a trigger, destroy it and give us some points. So let's go do that. I'm going to tell the player capsule to have a new script. So I'm just going to remove that script there because I did a test earlier so I can remove that script. I'm going to create a new script here that is going to be called something like Queens. That will do. Notice the capital letter, otherwise things tend to break. And the job of Queens is really very simple. When it touches anything, so I can again delete the start and the update functions here. On trigger enter. Notice on trigger enter, not on trigger enter 2D or blah 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 blah. I want on trigger enter. Write it all out for us. If you haven't got the autocomplete written, that's the line of code that you need. Private void on trigger enter collider other. That thing there is referring to the collider of the other thing, other thing involved in the collision. Remember, this is from the context of the player, so the coin will be the other thing involved in the collision. First thing I want to do is to destroy the other thing involved in the collision. That line of code is incomplete, though looks right. And the problem here is the other thing involved in the collision is a collider. So if I show you this, what that line of code will do is when the player touches this coin, it will find the other thing involved in the collision, which is this collider here, and destroy it. Not get rid of the coin, it will get rid of its collider, which can be really confusing. So what you need to do is tell the other thing, I don't want to, I don't want to destroy your collider, I want to destroy the game object to which the collider is attached. Other.gameObject, notice the lowercase g, uppercase o. 
what we also want to do is to gain some points. Because this object is attached to the player and we're only going to have one player in our game, we can add a line just above here. So I've gone to line six and given myself some space. I would like to create a public integer because this will be a whole number and I'm going to call this score. I'm going to set score to zero, semicolon to say that I'm done. And when we destroy the other object, we're also going to tell score to go up by one. So that's what the plus plus is doing and the semicolon to say that we're done. Increment by one. And let's see what that does. So the player should be able to walk over to the thing that it is touching. It's going to walk over to the coin. We touch the coin. The coin has vanished. If we go to the player capsule, you will see that on the coin script, we now have a score of one. In order to now have lots of coins throughout our scene, I could copy paste that, but there's a far better way of doing this. If I go into the prefabs folder, we've got a bunch of prefabs already within our scene. Remember, these are the prefabricated objects that we can have multiple instances of. Instances meaning that if you wanted to affect one, you could affect the, the other copies of it, which is very useful for a prefab. I've got my little coin here which I've currently ca called Cylinder. Let's rename that to Coin. And if I dragged and dropped the coin, no, it's not from here, that won't work, but from the hierarchy, if I drag that into the prefab space, then you can make as many coins in your scene as you like. And if you affect one, you can affect another one. Like so. Let's just test that this works. They should all have the same properties and I should pick that coin up. The coin has disappeared. If I look at the player capsule and keep an eye on my score, I've got one, I've got two. It should work basically. Three, four, five, all gone. We're going to improve this script though because there's some glaring potential problems with it. First thing is if you add many different types of objects in your game with triggers, they will all be treated as if they're a coin. They'll all give you score and they'll all be destroyed when you touch them, which is not the behaviour that we want. The behaviour that we want is to only destroy things if it has a tag of coin. So I'm going to pick on, I could pick one coin in the scene, or I can choose the coin prefab in the prefab space, which is what I'm going to do because that will affect all of them currently in your scene. So with the coin selected, I'm going to give it a new tag. I'm going to add a tag because one doesn't already exist. Click in the little plus icon and I'm going to create a tag called coin. Now I can go back to my prefabs, choose coin and then choose coin from the drop down because making a tag doesn't attach it at the same time. Now we can improve our script on trigger enter if the other thing had the tag of coin, then you destroy it and increase the score. Otherwise, that would be bad. Okay. I'm always testing, has that broken anything? It should be exactly the same, but introduces potential solving uh, solutions. Now notice how we didn't change each coin, but by affecting the prefab object affected all the, all the instances of it, and instancing is a key word. Let's go and make it now, so we've got a nice little bit of music. Uh, God, I'm all the way down here, completely wild today, not following my own instructions, what madness. That's where we are, let's make it play some sounds on collection, let's do that while we're here. When we enter into the trigger zone, we're also going to get it to play a sound effect. I already have a sound effect queued up, which I've got in my downloads folder. Downloads folder... that looks about right. Quite nice. But ding! I'm going to pull that into the game. And I'm going to attach that to the prefabs object. So there's my sound effect. 
I'm going to move that into the prefabs folder, otherwise this may get a bit challenging to do. With the coin selected, I'm going to drag and drop that sound effect, which will add an audio source, and you can see how they've all now generated audio sources. We can change play on awake because we don't want this to play automatically. We've got the sound effect and we can change all sorts of settings. If you remember, we tend to change the spatial blend to 3D and we tend to change the range down quite a bit. I only want this to have a smallish range, something like that. In order to get this to play, we're going to say get component of type audio source play one shot I think it will want let's just do play and see if play works what that should do is take the audio clip that is attached and play it now if my OBS settings are working you should hear this let's have a look we'll see if this works in a second Well, I've got nothing then. Right. That didn't work because I'm daft. There is no audio source component attached to the object this script is attached to because that is attached to the player. It's the other thing that has the audio source other.get component of type audio source and go and play its effect. That's what that was complaining there. Argument null exception because there was no audio source component attached. Can a player disable audio source? Hmm. Play one shot it is. What does play one shot need? It needs the clip. Okay, we're going to have to make this a little bit more complicated. So what we're going to have to do here is also create a public audio clip. She's going to be called Queen Noise. And when we play one shot, we play the Queen Noise. What one shot means here is play once and don't repeat. That's what one shot is referring to. All we now need to do is tell our player what that audio clip is. So you see there's now a spot there for what audio source we want to play. That audio source, or you can choose the circle and choose the audio clip that we want. Click the little circle there. And let's get this working. Still having none of it. Okay, let's do some debugging. Why do you reckon you're disabled? You're clearly enabled. Right, debugging time. Talk amongst yourselves or just skip to when I solve the problem. on play on awake so they're clearly not disabled I no longer need anything there hmm spatial blend is 3d Let's talk through my logic and figure out the problem. If you've already solved it, give yourself a pat on the back uh, and apologies for making you cringe while you sat through me trying to solve something. We destroy the object before we ask the object to make a noise. That's very dumb. Let's make the noise and then destroy the object, shall we? Does that make more sense? 
it's 10 o'clock, it's a Sunday night. Right, work. Still destroying the object? Hmm. destroy the object anymore. There is a, a cheap and dirty fix to this problem. Destroy the other game object and I'm going to pass in a parameter of 1 which means destroy the other object after one second has passed. You can fiddle with these numbers to make it just long enough to play your audio source. There you go. The player probably won't notice it's not deleting immediately. No, that's quite visible. Let's um, Change that to something like 0.2F. Remember, if you're dealing with decimal numbers, you need to finish it with an F for float. <coughs> 0 0.2 ain't long enough. Let's try 0 0.3. You get the idea. Have some fun with some numbers. Your sound effects and your mileage may vary. The only thing I want to do before we finish up this particular bit is all of our coins are currently taking up a lot of space in our hierarchy. If you have lots of coins, you'll have a lot of space taken up in the hierarchy. So I want you to control click each one. So I'm control left clicking, right click on them and create an empty parent. The parent is going to be called coins. Then if you do add any more coins, you can drag it into the coins object and then position it wherever you like. All this does is just work like a folder, basically keeps all your coins together. So where are we right now? Apart from completely going wildly off on a tangent, we have collecting objects to increase the score. We're playing sound on collection. Uh, in the next video, we will be doing spawn points, timers, win-lose, player prefs, and making a build. Look forward to seeing you there.